uh, his lecture on uh, multiplicity of points on Schubert varieties will be delivered. So I invite Kian Raghavan to resume his lecture. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the organizers. Thanks to the organizers and welcome back to this. I forgot to do something last time, so let me do it this time. Namely, uh, uh, you know, I was rather reluctant to speak on, at this seminar because uh, um, my recent work isn't the kind that would maybe of, be of interest to the audience uh, in this seminar. But uh, this topic uh, that I'm talking about was suggested by Juga. Um, so, uh, and so I accepted. And so here we are. So welcome back uh, so to the second talk. Um, so let me do a bit of recall. Uh, so we're talking about Hilbert functions, in particular multiplicities of points on Schubert subvarieties in Grassmannians. So fixed integers, d less than or equal to m, these are fixed for the rest of the talk. Gdn denotes the Grassmannian of d-dimensional subspaces in c to the n, n-dimensional complex vector space. As I mentioned last time, the underlying field does not matter. You can take pretty much any field. And since you're going to do some algebraic geometry, maybe you want it to be algebraically closed. But the characteristic of the field does not play a role at all. But I'm just using C for the sake of simplicity and familiarity. Okay, And as we saw last time, so GDN has an embedding in projective space of this vector space. So n choose d dimensional vector space. So this projective space will be one less dimensional. So it's n choose d minus one. Okay, And uh, that was the Plucker embedding. So just briefly to recall how it is done, uh, to give to in order to specify a d-dimensional subspace in C, and you can do so by just specifying uh, a set of basis vectors for this uh, d-dimensional subspace. Now that you can think of as a, an n cross d matrix of full rank, uh, where the uh, column the e, each ele each column represents one basis element, and there are d columns. Um, and then what you can do is just map it, the uh, take the d by d determinants of this matrix. There are n choose d of them, and those will provide the projective coordinates on this. Um, uh, those will be the values of the projective coordinates. So uh, if you do that, then as we saw last time, this becomes an um, you know the image of GDN is a closed sub-variety inside this projective variety. And GDN is a non-singular projective variety of dimension d times n minus d. Now, it is non-singular because, uh, because it's a homogeneous space. There is a transitive action of GLN on GDN. Uh, define IDN to be d subsets of cardinality d of 1 through n. And this, given an element i of that, I denote uh, if i1 through id are the elements of that i, then I arrange that in increasing order. So this is id, and we had seen this last time. This is very important for uh, this combinatorial set is very important. For example, the projective coordinates are uh, indexed by this uh, set id. Okay, and yeah, as I just mentioned, GLN acts transitively on this Grassmannian. And let B be the set of upper triangular matrices in GLN. Okay, this is a Borel subgroup, if you know what that means. If not, then just, just take it to be the upper triangular matrices in GLN. And given uh, an element W of IDN, we can define as uh, e w to be a particular point on this grass plane, namely the span of e w one e w d, where e one e up through e n are the standard basis vectors in C n. Okay, so you fix, uh, you have the standard basis vectors, 
and W1 through WD are some integers between 1 and D. So it makes sense to um, talk about this particular subspace of uh, CN. It's D dimensional and therefore defines a point on the grass point. Okay. Um, and the Schubert variety is by definition, we had given an alternative definition as well, but let us, you can take this to be the definition. You take the B orbit of EW. Remember, B is a subgroup of GLN, therefore it acts on GDN. So you take this element, the point EW on the Grassmannian, B acts on it, and you, that's the B orbit, and you take its closure. And, uh, and as it's very easy to see that uh, the B orbit closure, you can write it as a union of B orbits again. Um, that is, in general, too, an orbit closure always is a union of orbits. Uh, and if you do that in this case, there are finitely many orbits in the orbit closure. And um, those you can those are parameterized by elements V less than or equal to W, um, uh, where V less than or equal to W means, maybe I'll uh, write this here. Um, um, let me use green ink for it. So V less than or equal to W means, oh, oh sorry, what's this? Uh, v less than or equal to W means, just to remind you, V1 less than or equal to W1, and so on up to Vn, Vd, sorry, less than or equal to Wd. Okay, so this defines a partial order on IDN, and uh, um, so EV belongs to XW if and only if V less than or equal to W in this partial order. Okay, and the, our question is, given V less than or equal to W, find Hilbert function or the multiplicity of the local ring at EV of this uh, Schubert variety. Okay, and the answer must be in terms of just this combinatorial data, these integers V1 through Vd and W1 through W. Okay, so um, this is the question that we are trying to answer. And okay, um, so this is how we go about uh, answering this. There are many different approaches to this problem. The approach that we are uh, that I, I'm going to describe today is that using standard standard monomial theory, and um, so here is what we had done last time. So let me recall um, this. So fix v less than or equal to w. Now for the rest of the talk, v less than or equal to w will remain fixed. So I want to concentrate on a neighborhood of V. So what I can do is uh, rather than look at the projective variety XW, I can invert one of the projective coordinates and look at an, aff uh, uh, an affine patch around V. So that in order to do that, uh, I observe that the projective coordinate PV uh, of EV is equal to 1. Well, if I write down the matrix of EV, it will be uh, like so. So there will be for precisely. So if I choose, uh, so let us uh, recall how I uh, get PV. So I take a uh, take a point of the Grassmannian, take a basis um, uh, for that space. So a basis I can choose by just choosing uh, the. So if I choose the matrix which is identity at the um, rows that are defined by v and zeros elsewhere that precisely gives me ev and pv is um, because it's the i just choose the matrix the sub uh, the rows corresponding to v uh, pv of ev is clearly one so P, the point is pv at ev is non zero so what i can do is i can take this uh, PV not equal to zero and intersect my Schubert variety. And so this becomes a 
I get an open neighborhood inside that Schubert variety of the point EV, which I'm interested in. Okay? And all this action, if you wish, is taking place inside GDM intersect this PV not uh, inverted uh, of once you invert PV. Okay. Um, this uh, GDN intersect this uh, PV not equal to zero is an affine space of dimension D cross N minus D. Okay? And it has coordinates um, XRC, so you can uh, have these coordinates parameterized to coordinates as follows X sub RC, where R and C are between 1 and N, C is an element of V and R is not in V. Remember, V is a D element subset. So C will have D choices and R will have N minus D choices. So this is of dimension D cross N minus D. And uh, so this, for example, shows that GDN is a, has dimension D cross N minus D. Uh, it's an irreducible smooth projective variety. Okay. So uh, here is the matrix. Uh, you arrange this XRC in a matrix as follows. So you have a D by N matrix. You have the columns are um, repre represent elements of V. So I'm taking here V to be 2, 5, 6. Okay, this example is for 2, 5, 6, and n equal to 7 here. So I have these seven numbers here, 1 through 7. And I put the, the set, you know, 2, 5, 6, the rows corresponding to V, those I make it to be identity, and I take variables elsewhere. Right? I, the reason why I want to make these identity is because I'm that is precisely PV, and I want to make PV equal to one. Okay, so in this with this uh, uh, parameterization, so to speak, um, the point EV becomes the origin, right? Because uh, for EV, the the these values. Remember, EV. Uh, how do I get EV? I, I should take zero, one, zero. You know, I should take the identity matrix at uh, rows of V and zeros elsewhere. So that's why EV is the origin. And X sub RC is, you can think of that as the as this coordinate, P theta divided by PV, where theta is, so if I take this for example, um, so, so you, you can think of uh, P, th so if I remove this two from, um, sorry, if I, if I remove 5 from V and put in 1, so I get 1, 2, 6. So that is the value of theta. So I, I can think of this x1, 5 as P theta by PV, where theta is, you remove that C from V and put in that value of R. So for example, this one will be remove 5 and put in 1. So it, it is, this corresponds to, this x1, 5 corresponds to uh, P1, Two six divided by PV, okay, and okay, and so this um, this, uh, this open patch around uh, V, around EV, is defined by these uh, um, functions. F theta is equal to P theta by PV where theta is not less than or equal to w, okay? So this is because we had seen this last time. This is simply because the equations for the Schubert variety are precisely given by p theta such that theta is not less than or equal to w. So the it is very easy to see from that that the affine open patch is given by these equations. This is rather trivial, okay? So, uh, and let's observe that the degree of so f theta will be homogeneous because what is f theta? f theta is you take these p theta, you know, uh, p theta here. So you take the uh, rows corresponding to theta and take that determinant, and that's what it is. And if you so, for example, let's go here and do an example. So 
suppose I take W is equal to 357, and then I write out all theta that is not less than or equal to W, right? So what are all the theta that are not less than or equal to W? I made the list here, right? So I should have, if I have six, seven, then no matter what what is the, what the first coordinate is, all those all those will be le not less than or equal to W. So that's one, two, seven, two, two, six, one, six, seven, two, six, seven, three, six, seven, four, six, seven, and five, six, seven, right? So let us look at one, six, seven. So what it means is I look at one, six, and seven. Look at those rows and take the uh, determinant of that. Because of this one here. I see that 1, 6, 7 will be just x12, x75 minus x72, x, x, x15. It will be the, it will be this, uh, these four elements here, that 2 by 2 matrix, that is the uh, 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 that is f, f167 will be this value, possibly with a negative sign, but that doesn't matter. Okay. 2, 6, 7 similarly is so six seven, uh, six, seven here and two. So two, six, seven will give me X seven, five and so on. So these are what I observe is that the degree. So this is going to be a determinant. Each of these F theta is going to be a determinant. And what will be its degree? Its degree will be given by how much theta differs from V. So that I call the V degree of theta. And that is the same as the, you know, this set minus you take those elements of theta that are not in V and count how many there are or what is the same, what amounts to the same. You look at those elements of V which are not in theta and count their cardinality. Okay, F theta are homogeneous. And so this thing here, this uh, thing we are looking at is graded. Okay, because the F theta turn out to be homogeneous in our case. Okay? And just to continue this example here, Suppose I want to, in this case, I want to compute the Hilbert function of multiplicity. I claim this is not a very interesting example because if I look at all these equations, I want you, I want you to observe that look here, x75, x42, and x72 are already there. So this one doesn't matter because this has 42 and 72 in it. This also has 42, 72 in it. This has 75 and 72, and both 75 and 72 are there. This has 7, 5, and 7, 2 as well. So the 2 by 2 determinants don't matter at all. So what I have is actually these nine variables, but then I go modulo three variables, which means I have out of 12, I've gone modulo three. So YVW is actually an affine nine dimensional subspace. Okay. Um, so in this case, the multiplicity Hilbert function, everything is multiplicity is one, and the Hilbert function is whatever it is. I can, it's the polynomial ring, the same as that of the polynomial ring in nine variables. So it's easy to compute. Okay. And, uh, but very soon we'll do a more interesting example. Um, so dimension of XW is always going to be, you take W1 minus one plus W2 minus two plus W3 minus three and so on and add them up. So this is, I've taken it to be three, five, seven. So the dimension is three minus one plus 5 minus 2 plus 7 minus 3, which gives me 2 plus 3 plus 4, which is 9. Okay, and which is precisely, th that is the dimension of this YVW as well, because it's an open set in this irreducible variety. Okay, okay. Now let's do a more interesting example. Um, here it is. So uh, if you recall last time, I said the determinantal variety, um, if you look at, um, some m cross n matrices of rank less than or equal to some t, then that is, that uh, is a special case of what we are looking at. And so I want to illustrate this by this example. So this is not a particular example. Any such determinant variety you can get as a special case by doing something similar that we are going to do now. Okay. So for example, let me put v is equal to 1, 2, 3 and w is equal to 3, 6, 7, with d equal to 3 and n equal to 7. Okay, So these are the values I'm fixing of d, n, v, and w. In that case, here is my matrix of coordinates in which all the action is taking place. And I uh, uh, to get my y, v, w, 
I must look at all theta that is not less than or equal to w and look at all those f theta, right? Now, I observe given these value, given this value of w, if this, I claim theta is not less than or equal to w if and only if theta does not contain 1, 2, or 3. See, the moment theta contains 1, 2, or 3, these, the value of 6 and 7 are the largest possible out of these remaining 4. Therefore, if theta contains 1, 2, or 3, say 1, 5, 6, then that's going to be less than w, less than equal to w. Okay? So the only way theta is not going to be less than or equal to w is if it does not contain 1, 2, 3. Okay? And uh, then clearly I must, so theta values are, I'm choosing three out of these four. And so I'll get all the three by three minors of this three by four matrix. Okay. So, um, so what is YVW? It's precisely four by three matrices of rank less than or equal to two. Okay. Okay. And let me, uh, I want to give you the theorem about multiplicity, but let me give you um, work it out in this particular example first. So how do you compute multiplicity? I want to give you a procedure for how to you complete, uh, compute this multiplicity. Okay, I'm going to st state the theorem in this slide later, but let us go through the procedure in this example and then I'll state the theorem. So what you do is the following. You make a grid. That is the first step. And how do you make the grid? You put the elements of V here on top those are the uh, columns and put elements R not in V in the uh, as indexing the rows. Okay. In this case, it is going to be a rectangular grid, but in general, it may be slight more, it may be a more ladder like shape because uh, I only look at those values with R bigger than C. Okay. In this case, it is the full rectangular grid. We will do another example. I'll show you an, an another example where the grid is not rectangular. So then I mark points on the grid as follows. This is how I mark points. I'm talking about these green points here. So how I mark, mark those points is as follows. I take W, which is 3, 6, 7 in my case, and I compare it with V, which is 1, 2, 3, and I cancel whatever is common. So cancel the common numbers. Okay, 3 is gone. And now, what of what remains, I start with the smallest and pair it up with the largest possible, but that is the, that which is less than that. So 6 pairs with 2 and 7 pairs with 1. So once I have paired 6 with 2, I remove both 6 and 2 from consideration and then move on to 7. 7 has to pair with 1. That's what is left. Okay. We'll do a, uh, I'll do a more complicated example. Uh, but I hope this is clear. You cancel all common numbers, then pair the ones, the 6 with the 2 and the 7 with the 1. And I mark these here. Right? So this is 6, 2 and 7, 1. Now, from each of those marked points, draw vertical line up and horizontal line right to the boundary. So if I draw a vertical line up and a horizontal line, line to the right, all the way to the boundary. Okay. So this is my first point, and this is A1 and B1. This is my second point, A2 and B2. Oh, I see that I've called, uh, maybe this should have been my first point, and this should have been my second point, but it doesn't matter in which order you name them. You, have, you take this set of points and mark them, and name them however, order them in however way, you, whichever way you want. Okay? So, but what the important thing is, that this gives me two points, A1 and B1. This gives me two points, A2 and B2 on the boundary. Right. Okay. And now what the theorem is that the multiplicity is precisely the number of tuples of lattice paths. So a lattice path is I start with A1 and go to a B2, but I, I move along either down or to the right, like so. Okay, that is an example of a lattice path. Okay. So I must choose a lattice path from A1 to B1 and a lattice path of it from A2 to B2 such that 
those two paths do not intersect. So let me, for example, draw an example of such a path. So for example, a, a, such a tuple of paths could be like this. Ah, sorry, I made a mistake. It should not intersect. If I go to B2, it will intersect. So, for example, here is a tuple, a two tuple in this case. Uh, here is one lattice path A1 to B1. Here is one lattice path A2 to B2. Okay. Now, let me draw just another set of lattice paths. Or, uh, for example, these paths that are shown here, for example, A2 all the way down to the green point and B2. The, all the way here and here. That is another tuple of lattice paths, and so on. And you write down all such lattice paths, and the count uh, and their count is the multiplicity. So the claim, the theorem is, this multiplicity that you want equals the number of non-intersecting tuples of lattice paths a1 through b1, a2 to b2, etc. Okay. I hope uh, hope this. Uh, um, thing is clear. If there are any questions, uh, um, if, uh, is this clear? The procedure for multiplicity. If there are questions, I can answer. Okay. So, um, uh, if you recall, for the determinant, uh, the, for the determinant variety, which of uh, which uh, this uh, the example that we are considering is a is one of the examples. There was a uh, determinant formula given by Jambelli in 1909 and you can recover that because there is this uh, beautiful lemma due to Lindstrom, Gessel and Vienmo for which a reference is uh, the, the nice book proofs from the book. Uh, a chapter of that book is devoted to this uh, um, Lindstrom, Gessel, Vienmo lemma and what it says is the following. So, so it gives a binomial determinant formula for to count the stuple of non-intersecting lattice paths. So what you do is, so in this case, for example, so there, uh, if I have an n tuple, then it's going to be an n by n matrix. And what are the entries? Uh, the entries will be just number of paths from A1 to B1. That will be the 1, 1 entry. The number of paths from A1 to B2. Remember, we are not going from A1 to B2, but in the form, in the determinant entry, you write all the paths possible lattice paths from A1 to B2. Don't worry about any other paths. Just write down the total number of paths from A1 to B2. That will be the second entry. Uh, one, two entry. What will be the two, one entry? It will be the number of paths from A2 to B1. What will be the second entry in the second row? That will be all the paths from A2 to B2. Number of paths. And so if you do that in this example, for example, uh, five choose two is the number of paths from from here A1 to B1, it is five choose two because I have five steps to go and two of which I have to go to the right and I can choose however I want. Okay? Remember, I, I, there is no intersection or anything here. We are just counting all lattice paths from A1 to B1. Similarly, from A1 to B2 is four steps, two of which are to the right. So that's four choose two. From A1, A2 to B1, it is four, one, two, three, four steps out of which one is to the right. That's four choose one. And from here to here, it is three steps out of which one is to the right. So that's three choose one. And so you get this determinant formula. So what I'm saying is, although this procedure itself seems like uh, it is quite far from this formula of Giambelli, I'm saying that if combining with this, this idea of Lindstrom, Gessel, and Vienno, in fact, gives you the Giambelli formula. So what we have recovered by this process is the Giambelli formula and an algebraic proof of the Giambelli formula. Okay. Uh, any questions? Uh, I'm going to do one more example now. Uh, If there are no more questions, I'll proceed. Okay. Aha, uh -huh. I see that there was, a, I am missing something. Uh, I wanted to show you one more example and uh, 
let me just switch. Um, Raghun, there is a question from Sarang. Yes, yes, Sarang. Yeah. So he is asking, uh, can you explain again how you mark the points? Sure. Yes. So I choose my, uh, I, I suppose you can see my cursor. Uh, yes. I, I, so you ca cancel all that is common to both V and W. So I cancel the three and the three, right? And then I take the smallest one of what is left and pair it with the highest possible one that is less than that. Okay, six goes with two. And then seven goes with one. Once once things get paired, you remove them. Maybe things will be clearer if I do. Pairing something else. Uh, sorry for that. We have lost your slide. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I, I, I'll just uh, come. Um, uh, um, Um, sorry, I seem to have. Um, so let me. Oh, sorry, let me. Just one second, please. Um, I'm having some technical difficulty. Just one second. Okay. Okay. So I want to do a more co complicated example, uh, but maybe I'll postpone it to the end um, because I, I had it worked out, but somehow it is vanished from my um uh, uh, slides and uh, i don't know how that happened uh, uh, i was having several versions of it and somehow i'm, I'm sorry about that so uh, let me move on and if uh, if time permits i will come back to that example that i wanted to do okay so that was the multiplicity interpretation okay so uh let me go on to the a theorem about Grobner basis. Okay, uh, so the generators f theta. These are the standard uh, natural generators of the uh, of the ideal of this y v w the variety that we are interested in. And all, remember, all the action is happening inside this polynomial ring of uh, d times n minus d variables. Okay. The claim is that they form a Grobner basis in any anti-diagonal term order. That is the claim. So some comments on this. Uh, the case when V is equal to 1 to D, like for example, this is the case for the determinantal variety. This uh, theorem is due to Herzog-Chung. And for the particular case of the determinantal variety itself, Remember, not only for the determinantal variety, not only is V is equal to 1 to D, but W is also something very specific. So Herzog-Chung fix V, but not W. But if you fix both V and W so as to get the determinantal variety, then that theorem is due to Sturmfeld's. 
Okay? And anti-diagonal term order just means that the anti-diagonal term in any determinant is picked as the initial term. Okay, so for example, um, um, so I, I'm just giving you an example of this V is equal to 1, 3, 5, and say theta is equal to 2, 3, 6, then F theta will be P theta by PV, and so it means I should take 2, 3, 6, those three rows and take the determinant, I get this, and so x21, x65 is the diagonal term, x61, x25 is the anti-diagonal term, and that will be the initial term. So you can choose any term order, and there are many of them, I can assure you. Uh, for example, you can, um, you can take those in a higher row to be more initial, and for those in the same row, you can take those to be in the latter columns to be more initial. So, for example, x43 is less initial than anything in the second row, but those in the second row, those uh, the, the ones in the fifth column is uh, higher than this, more initial than this, and so on. Then, naturally, you will pick x25, x61 as the initial term. Okay, there are many, many different term orders which will pick the anti-diagonal term as the initial term. And so, this is, you can think of the main theorem as a, as a Grobner basis theorem, okay? Um, okay, now let me move on, okay. Um, can I ask a question, Raghav? Sure, 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 Sudhir. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, you, you took uh, N cross D matrix and uh, modded out and so on. Uh, so, if you were to sort of take D cross N matrices and, uh, you know, look at the uh, minus index by the columns, then it would correspond to diagonal term order? Uh, no, 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 no. It doesn't work out that, uh, that uh, no. Ah, good question. So, you are saying, why am I insisting on the anti-diagonal term order? Right, right. No, it doesn't work that easily. Uh, uh, no, because uh, see, this uh, matrix is oblong. You know, is uh, is more uh, how to say mm, tall. has more uh, is tall. Uh, yeah, it's not a flat matrix. Tall it's a tall a matrix. Yeah. And uh, um, and then you are and then there is see. Remember, so if you take a rectangular matrix, then it may not make much of a difference, but um uh, but the determinants that you are going to take may not be as, remember we are choosing um, not necessarily maximal minors not necessarily maximal minors and not necessarily minors that are you know um uh see they are uh, see it is not obvious in that if you only look at the determinantal variety yes okay but if you look at other varieties then the anti-diagonal and the diagonal term orders are different. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about anti-diagonal term order and diagonal term order if I uh, towards the end. No, because you know in the classical determinantal variety case, yeah, the usual generators are a universal Grobner basis. Right, it does not matter so, it, in the classical case. It does not matter. Uh, but one doesn't have such things here, I suppose. Um, there are theorems about diagonal term orders as well. But the one that we are getting now is about is with anti-diagonal term order. Okay. And I, I don't know whether using this, this method you can get for the diagonal term order. The two are different. Sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, welcome. Yeah. Uh, so uh, j j now uh, passing on to the Hilbert function. So I just want to remind you, what, this is the theorem that we talked about last time. I even gave a proof of this, although I'm afraid I didn't do a good job of the proof. It is fairly elementary to prove uh, from uh, the main theorem of standard monomial theory. That is the main theorem by which I mean Hodge's theorems, which give, which says, for example, that the um, standard monomials form 
a basis of the homogeneous coordinate ring uh, of the Graspanian. And for the Schubert variety, all you need to do is take standard monomials in which all the term, all the mono, um, num, uh, the things you use from IDN are less than or equal to W. Um, so this is just to remind you, we, this is the main technical thing that enables, uh, that bridges standard monomial theory with the combinatorics that we are doing. So let V be less than or equal to W in IDN. The V compatible W dominated st standard monomials in F theta of degree L form a basis for the Lth graded piece of this, of this uh, uh, graded ring, right? This is the graded ring and I want to compute its Hilbert function and, and its multiplicity and so on. So uh, I have now uh, a basis for the Lth graded piece. And just to recall, F theta is P theta by PV, as we have seen several times above. Monomial is standard if theta 1 is bigger than or equal to theta 2 is bigger than or equal to theta k. It's called W dominated if W is bigger than or equal to theta 1. And if it's, it's V compatible means all theta, all the things theta 1 through theta k are comparable to V, but none is equal to V. Okay, and one more definition to complete the statement of the theorem. What do I mean by the degree of this? It is just the you know degree of f theta plus you know each of the degree of the f thetas. So it is the natural degree of this uh, polynomial inside the polynomial ring, and that is v degree of theta one plus v degree of theta k, which is just the cardinality here, some of the cardinalities here. Okay, and so the corollary is. So we have uh, uh, something at least for the Hilbert function. So this is the Lth graded piece of this graded ring has dimension equal to the number of, I, all I need to do is count W dominated V compatible standard monomials of degree L and I have a notation for this, right? SMVWL. Okay, so this doesn't get you very far because this thing, while it reduces it to combinatorics, uh, SMVWL is uh, really not very useful combinatorially. So what you need to do, and this is the crux main piece of the work, you have to convert it into another combinatorial set from which you can read off all those multiplicity and Grobner bases and so on. Okay. But this is, the, so uh, this corollary represents a, a, the stage where we move from geometry or algebra to combinatorics. Let me also mention here, for because um, this is very important if you're going to think of generalizing this, the following. So um, just looking ahead a little bit, if I want to look at, um, um, if I want to solve the problem, for Schubert variety in more general flag varieties, then the I will standard monomial theory exists in great generality, and you can try to get uh, equations for the for the variety y v w. Similarly, you can intersect it with the projective, uh, you know, with p v not equal to zero. You can do all that. You can get up to y y v w has uh, has an anal analogous definition, and you have that. And everything is happening inside an uh, polynomial ring or an affine space. That is also okay. The problem is the equations defining this will not be homogeneous. Okay, the uh, point that you want to concentrate on, namely E v, will continue to be the origin in this uh, affine variety. But the equations defining will not be homogeneous. Therefore, if you want to then compute this. Uh, uh, you know, this will not be a graded ring. So you cannot write this. Uh, so I hope you can see this. This one, this one, uh, see what what you, what I want here is actually, what I want here is O X W E V. That's what I want. And what it is is, is the associated graded ring of this ring at the maximal ideal. But it so happens that in our case that this is a, Graded ring, so I, I uh, you know, uh, the calculation of the associated graded ring, which is the algebraic step, 
is not at all required. And I can directly pass from geometry to combinatorics. And that's what is happening here. And if you want to do this more generally, there is this algebraic step where you have to move from this ring C, Y, V, W to the to this, which means, uh, I mean, to localize. So this is, of course, local. But then I want to move to GIR of uh, this uh, M, you know, the R, where this is, if you think of this as a, a local ring R, M, I want to move to this associated graded ring. And I want to calculate uh, equations for that, which means I have to do algebraic work. And that is the bottleneck. And I, if, uh, as far as I know, nobody knows how to do that in general. And that could be a very interesting commutative algebraic problem. OK, so let me move on. Okay. Um, Okay, so now let me say the technical theorem. I was just saying that this uh, in the last slide here, sorry, uh, this thing here is a combinatorial set, but it is not very useful combinatorially. So it ne we need to convert this into some other kind of combinatorial set. And for that, towards that, we have this theorem. And this is the technical heart of the uh, work. It says there is a degree preserving bijection between this set, this combinatorial set, and SVWM. So what is this? This is the set of W dominated monomials in RV of length L. RV is just the polynomial, you know, this the, the, this is the indexing set for all the uh, variables in our polynomial ring in which all the action is happening. And what does W dominated mean? So if I take a monomial in those variables, so let's, so a, a chain in, in that monomial is, if, is, is, uh, is a sequence like this, R1, C1, R2, C2, such that the R1s are decreasing, strictly decreasing, and C1s are strictly um, increasing. So let me just show this in a picture. So I take a monomial, and in the monomial, in the X sub RCs, and if a term like this occurs, that is called a V chain, like R1, C1, R2, C2, and I, I move to the northwest, strictly to the, sorry, to the northeast, strictly to the northeast each time. Such is called a V chain or chain. And for every such chain, I look at if I have such a chain in the monomial, then I take V and remove those elements C. Remember, C elements C, all those belong to V and R's do not belong to V. So if I remove the elements, those C's from V and add the R's, right, then I'll get some other element of IDN, and that must be less than or equal to W. This is what that W dominated means. OK? And just let me point out why this is heuristically uh, in, um, meaningful. Because you see XR, if you see such a term, this is precisely the anti-diagonal term of a determinant. If I choose this determinant, an appropriate determinant, and you see this is going to be the anti-diagonal term in that determinant. OK, that gives some motivation for this definition, uh, although I admit that this is a bit mysterious at this point. But there it is. So you have to this is the crucial technical step. OK, and once you are down here to this SVWL, then you can pretty much uh, read off all the um, uh, data, whatever uh, you want, you can read it off. And that is going to be my next slide. OK. So here is the proof of the multiple steep procedure or formula. So easy to see from an inclusion exclusion from the technical theorem. So I'm assuming the technical theorem. So the technical theorem is the one that gives the um, bijection between degree preserving bijection between the two combinatorially defined sets 
SMVW and SVW. And so I'm using the here SVW. So the multiplicity equals the number of square free elements in SVW of maximum cardinality. Okay. This is an easy thing because of the Hilbert function is you count how many of degree L there are and just count that number and that gives you the Hilbert function. Then it follows that the multiplicity is just given by this number. This is very easy. It's just an elementary inclusion exclusion argument. Okay. So, and then it is e easy to combinatorially to identify these with tuples of non intersecting lattice paths. So, that is the proof that. Uh, the procedure that we earlier gave for multiplicity is valid. Okay. Uh, now let me just indicate the proof also for the Grobner basis. Okay. Once again, it is easy to see that if I take this f theta and take the initial of that f theta, which will be the anti-diagonal term, right? So if I look at those. And since theta is not less than or equal to w, it turns out that the that that that's a v chain. That that uh, uh, initial term is going to be the a v chain, and it is not going to be w dominated because this theta is not less than or equal to w here. Right? Okay. This is not a proof, but at least this looks the same. I'm taking theta not less than or equal to w, which means precisely that this initial f theta, that v chain, is not going to be w dominated. Okay? Thus, by the technical theorem, the natural subjection is going to be an isomorphism. So let us look at this subjection. What am I doing here? I am so so remember that my y v th w is defined by so the ideal of this is in fact. f theta, theta less than or equal to, not less than or equal to w, right? These are my equations, okay? Now, I take the initial initials of these, uh, e uh, these equations, and that's what I have put here. And here, on this, I'm taking the initial of any other, any element of that idea, okay? And as you understand, if this is not a Grobner basis, then it's possible to have some element in the ideal which has an initial term which is not generated by the initial term of the generators right that's possible so this is a smaller ideal in general and this is a bigger ideal in general and therefore this is a surjection in general but this is going to be an isomorphism because of the following reason now the fact that these in f thetas cancel all my um the things that are not W dominated will mean that what remains here are only the W dominated ones. And by the technical theorem, we've already shown that the number of those W dominated is actually the Hilbert function here. So it follows that this, 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 you know, the ideal here cannot be any bigger than this idea. If it were, then it would, we would get a contradiction to the technical theorem. So, uh, it follows that it follows very easily from the technical theorem that these form a Grobner basis in the anti diagonal term, term order. Let me also mention that, uh, you know, uh, all this can be phrased in terms of uh, Stanley Reisner face rings. And what you can see is that this thing here, uh, the denominator here, uh, so the denominator here will be a square-free monomial ideal. These are just the anti-diagonal term orders. And this thing is actually the Stanley Leisner face ring of a shallable simplicial complex. Okay, And so you can read out the multiplicity as the number of maximal dimensional faces of this complex. We had this interpretation that it was n tuples of non-intersecting paths where I should say not n tuples, but some number of tuples depends on how many of these a1, b1, a2, b2 you have. Okay, so it is tuples of non-intersecting lattice paths, but that also has an interpretation as maximal dimensional faces of this of a Stanley Reisner face ring, and this also shows because this uh, complex is shallable that this y v w is called Macaulay, 
and therefore it also shows since these are open patches of Schubert varieties and it's an arbitrary open patch, I can vary this V. So it will show that the Schubert varieties are co -mechanic. But this is not anything new. This is well known. But just that we get another proof of it if you wish. Okay. So in the process, you also have proved that the Schubert varieties are co-mechanic. Okay. So let me finally end uh, with the last few minutes uh, with some general comments. So many classes of varieties in the literature occur as patches of Schubert varieties. Maybe not just of the Graspanian, but of more general flag varieties, G mod Q, where Q is a parabolic subgroup of the reductive of a reductive algebra. So, okay. I mean, this is a, a non-exhaustive list here. And I, I will not write down names here because there are too many names and I'm afraid I will omit. I, there will be errors of omission if I start writing, but I'll try to mention some names. Okay, for example, ladder determinant varieties. Abhyankar and his school, Mule and Kulkarni and other people have studied ladder determinant varieties. These occur as open patches of Schubert varieties in flag varieties. Okay, so they can be studied by our Schubert varieties. Quiver varieties, which has been studied by Fulton and members of his school, Fulton Book and so on, and many others, they too can be thought of as patches of Schubert varieties. Variety of complexes here, uh, the names are Buxbaum, Eisenberg, De Concheny, Strickland, and then Eisenberg, Huniki, and so on. Those can also be studied. And circular complexes, um, various people here, uh, Mehta, Trivedi among them, those can also be uh, studied using Schubert varieties. Um, Fafian ideas. Uh, um, ideas generated by Fafians, as in the sense of uh, books from Eisen, but they can be studied. Symmetry determinant varieties, they too are open patterns of Schubert varieties. So Schubert varieties provide a unified approach to study all these varieties, both qualitative and quantitative. For example, if you want to say some ladder determinant variety is prime, that is immediate because the, it is an open patch of a Schubert variety, which is irreducible. And once you show that the, the, the ladder determinants that you're considering define the, uh, you know, the, are equal to the ideal of the uh, open patch, then you're done. Okay. And similarly for Cohen McCollinus, for qualitative as well as uh, quantitative uh, things. Okay. And more, and I'll mention this just a, um, a more, um, what I mean by this more in the next slide. Okay. And a reference for this, uh, is pages two, 204 and um, continued of this book uh, by Lakshmi Bai and myself, which is in the Encyclopedia of Mathematical Sciences, Springer. It's called um, st uh, Standard Monomial Theory and Invariant Theoretic Approach. And it, since uh, uh, Jugal raised the question of uh, singular loci of Schubert varieties, there is in fact a book with this title, Singular Loci of Schubert Varieties. It is due to Billy and Lakshmi Bai, uh, by Billy and Lakshmi Bai, it's in Burkhauser, Progress in Mathematics 182. That's a, a very good reference. Uh, it is, uh, it attempts to be comprehensive, I think. So, and here is my final slide. What about Schubert varieties in other flag varieties? The problem is open in general, even for uh, GLN mod B, full flag variety, although many special, special cases are known. And this is an ongoing uh, uh, project by for many people. And uh, the, there are many, as I said in the abstract, there are various approaches by various people. And um, there are many papers. And this is, again, an inexhaustive list. I'm sure I missed out some names here. But here are some, um, some ones, some papers. So there is the paper by Knudsen Miller called uh, it's uh, something Grobner geometry may be in the title, but it's about matrix Schubert varieties. Uh, so briefly, what a matrix Schubert variety is, is the following. So you have this uh, GLN and you have this GLN mod B. It, okay, and you take a Schubert variety in here. Okay, look at the pre-image here. We call this pi. And this is pi inverse of XW, right? 
and then this is sitting inside ML, the matrix. And so you, you take the closure of this. So you take the closure of this here in the matrix, and that's the matrix Schubert variety. And the, it's a very nice paper uh, published in the annals where they talk about various aspects of these uh, matrix Schubert varieties and uh, related to Schubert calculus and many other things. It's a very beautiful paper. And uh, it also has to do with, uh, for example, the case when the V is equal to identity and uh, singularity of Schubert varieties in the Graspanian can be recovered from the result, their results. Although they, they are, uh, although to do that would require uh, some expertise because that is not at all, it is not even mentioned anywhere in the paper. There is also the paper by Briom Polo. Um, there is Ikeda and Aruse, work by them. There is by a Vorpade and myself. And these are about symmetric determinant varieties. So th this is work. Uh, the analogous problem for Lagrangian or uh, symplectic Graspanians, uh, which amounts the open patches there, generalized symmetric determinant varieties. And there is uh, work by myself and Upadhyay, Shamashri Upadhyay. Uh, this has to do with ideals of Pavians. This is orthogonal Graspanians. And there is uh, Knudsen, Miller, Young, Knudsen, and Wu Young. And they uh, Wu and Young, they have some uh, cases that are not covered. So they, they, uh, some cases in GLN mod B of Schubert varieties, which are uh, which cannot be um, handled uh, otherwise. So this is there is there are some new cases here which are done, and most recently uh, there is a paper by Kreiman and Graham, 2000. It's a preprint still. And uh, uh, this one uh, also deals with the same problem. And they also have some new cases. But as I said, the problem is uh, very much open in general. And uh, I wanted to give you some idea about uh, the uh, proof of the technical theorem. But I seem to have lost that slide too. But maybe it's good because I'm over time. Let me just say that, as I said in that abstract, Kreiman has shown that that is the, the bijection of the main theorem is not some stupid bijection, but it's actually what is a bounded robinson shenstedt knuth correspondence. So uh, this is a very important bijection. It plays an important role in representation theory, combinatorics, geometry. And it turns out that this bijection is also some version of this. Uh, so it is really maybe God given and not arbitrary. Uh, thank you for your attention and sorry for if I have gone over time. Thank you, Raghavan, for your very interesting talk. We are open for questions. Then open your uh, microphone and uh, ask questions. Hi, uh, can I have ask one question? Uh, please. Uh, yeah. So, uh, do we have some formula also for the Betty numbers of uh, uh, OX, W, EV? Uh, so, is because this is graded in our context. Uh, uh, um, no, no, not, not. Uh, so for the determinantal variety itself, there is a, a resolution by Lasku, uh -huh. uh, which appears in the Hyderabad conference 1989. Okay. And even for the determinantal variety case, uh, that depends on the characteristic, right? If I am correct. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so uh, that is. Uh, I don't know. There is uh, Manoj and Lakshmi Bhai and Sheshadri have some. I don't remember if it has any. There is a recent paper by uh, Manoj Kumini, Pramatsana Chastri, Lakshmi Bhai, and uh, Sheshadri uh, uh -huh. four years ago or so. And uh, that may have something, something to say about this. You should ask Manoj. 
बट नो नो आई 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 डोंट नो आई नो आई डोंट नो थैंक यू वेलकम Again, in the case where uh, uh, you don't need to construct the uh, social graded ring, mm. uh, uh, do we have a commutatorial interpretation for the uh, later coefficients of the Hilbert polynomial? Uh, well, you have the simplicial complex. Okay, so from there one can. From there one can, I guess, um, do it. but you know the the multiplicity has this very nice commutatorial interpretation yeah so of course that is coming from the simplicial complex yes right? it is you can think of it as coming from the simplicial complex yes yeah, so that, that corresponds to the facets yes yeah, yeah. the maximal dimensional facets and it's a, it's a you know it's a cohn mccall simplicial complex so all the maximal all the maximal dimension maximal ones have the same cardinality so mm -hmm. so yeah i guess from there you can um, get uh, so there is uh, some h vector uh, you let me mention that uh, h vector will give sorry the h vector comes mm. from simplicial complex and uh, the derivatives the h vector has commutatorial interpretation mm hmm and, and so, there is no, yeah correct correct but uh, what exactly this uh, simplicial complex is is uh, um knutson and miller have uh, you know this metric schubert varieties they uh, they you know they, they have a paper in the advances mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so um there is work of knutson miller and knutson knutson which could be relevant so there are uh, uh, subword complexes that's the name so they try to i think identify what the simplicial complexes are if i'm not mistaken so there's something there maybe of uh, uh, you know the so this, there may be a description of this simplicial complex but once again if you ask a particular question how many faces of this dimension does it have it may not be easy well, so one uh, would then have a interpretation for the face numbers you mean no i don't know i'm not i i i don't know off the top of my head but uh you know these are this can get very complicated and they have is uh, subword complexes i think is the name for the simplicial complexes mm -hmm. so that may yeah that's that's uh, what all i have to say for that Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, Raghavan, related to what Shri Devi asked, ah. uh, is it not true that uh, explicit minimal free resolution for even the Grassmannian is not known in general? Uh, so there are two questions here. One is uh, what I understand uh, is that you can take the uh, mm, the Plucker relations themselves. Yes. And then try to. resolve that yes and i am told that nobody knows the answer to that is what i understand yes yes do you do you also have the same feeling yes okay. uh, yes. yes i there, learned there, there that from dn verma correct correct in fact uh, you see dn verma proposed something in g2n case but the point ah, is g2 ah. okay but g2n is understood Ah, correct. G two and I also remember there are some papers by some Russians maybe on the. Yeah, but you see, G G two and is is essentially known because in the in that case the Plucker relations they they corresponds exactly to the to the Fafian ideal. You know, in a. Ah, right, right. Now I remember. Yes. Yes. The, yes. For the Fafian, uh, you have a resolution which is continuing from the work of Lasku. This. Uh, Uh, mm. What is uh, Josephia and Ragaz? Uh, mm, 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 mm. So, so, so therefore, mm. uh, therefore, you know G two N in a 
in hindsight. But uh, for in general, mm. you can, I, I do not know, but I, I was just wondering if there is any recent progress on that. Uh, no, not kept up. So I, I, I don't know, but that doesn't mean anything. But I want to point out that that's a slightly different yes. problem. So that problem is, see, here we are on the open patch. So problem coincides with the with a certain open patch problem in the case of G2. Right? If because it's some half year ideal or something, and then you can uh, do something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but this is a slight this is a different problem and that's a different problem. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Here you have a determinantal sort of object. Is it not? Yeah. So let me also say that I, I wanted to say this and over didn't. So let me say this now that anytime you have an object defined by some determinant, some determinants or Fafians or anything to do with determinants, then very likely is a Schubert variety. Mm -hmm. uh, some Schubert variety underlying. And also that reminds me, I didn't say what that more was and more I said. Yeah. Um, and the more is the following. So here is the explanation for the more. Uh, suppose, uh, see, suppose I have a matrix, right? 100 by 2 matrix. And I want to look at 2 by 2 minus of this and then 3 by 3 minus of this. And uh, say I want to prove some theorem about all size minors of this of the ideals of all, all various size minors. And I have proved something for 2 by 2 minors, and I want to prove something for 3 by 3 minors. But there is, you know, that has a different, bigger dimension, or something has a, uh, the dimensions uh, are jumping quite a bit. But what the Schubert varieties do is that they sort of interpolate between these two. And there is, there is an inductive machinery that you can bring to play with Schubert varieties. There is there is lots of them and one in every dimension. So yeah. Uh, the, so uh, so when you when you look at open patches of Schubert varieties, these determinative varieties occur as special cases, but you will get many more, which will provide you many more objects to look at, uh, which you would not have thought of, uh, I'm afraid, without looking at uh, Schubert varieties. See, good point. And uh, so another question, you, when you uh, mentioned the theorem of Kraiman, uh, Lakshmi, and yourself and uh, uh, Kodialam. So uh, you said that the, that the, whatever, the associated simplicial complex is shellable and so on. So this shellability is proved in your paper or? No, 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 yeah. no. Uh, okay, uh, it's not proved in, uh, no, it's not proved in, uh, our paper. So, no. Sorry. Where is it? Yeah. Ah, uh, that's a good question. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe it is. Uh, it comes from Knutson Miller. Yes, they, they uh, do such things, it? Yeah, they do such things. Yes. Okay. Uh, so th that's a good question. You 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 nailed me there. Um, thank you for that. I I should be more no. careful. Uh, no, no, that's a very good point. Curious, you know, a good point you're making. I don't remember it. In, in no, correct, correct. But that's a good point. I, I sort of overstepped uh, my... Uh, I'm just a bit overstepping there. Uh, um, so maybe there is... Maybe maybe there is no written proof of that. So let's just say that. Yeah. Uh, but nobody is going to be surprised by that. I would imagine, but it may be worthwhile for somebody to write it down. I think absolutely, absolutely, it may be worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, good, good point that you're making. I agree. Okay, thanks, thanks for a very nice talk. Thank you for the questions. Raghun, I have a sort of historical question. What did Schubert do about Schubert varieties? Oh, I am really not the person to answer this question. But uh, so, so uh, the, all these questions about if you have uh, enumerative geometry, any uh, questions of enumerative geometry. So uh, if you have uh, so many um, uh, lines in some place and how many in how many points will they intersect or something like this, may, questions of enumerative geometry. So those are uh, naturally phrased 
as we now understand in terms of uh, uh, intersections of Schubert varieties. That is the cohomology ring and cup product in terms of uh, Schubert varieties. Classes of Schubert classes. Mm -hmm. So in modern language, what he was trying to do was uh, uh, compute uh, cup products. So uh, that's what I understand he was trying to do because those have interpretations in terms of uh, uh, enumerative geometry. And uh, also there is this uh, quantum, there are so many quantum things these days. Uh, um, many of these physics uh, invariants are uh, interpreted in terms of cohomology of uh, flag varieties. So. Yeah, he may have been trying to do other things as well, but that's definitely one thing he was trying to do. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Jugal, if I may say so, I mean, there is a nice expository article by Kleiman and Laxow called Schubert Calculus, published in the American Math Monthly. Okay. That can give uh, nice answers to your question, probably. Okay. Is that okay to say, Raghavan? Ah, yeah, that's okay. I just have one thing more to add. There is a, a article by I think Eisenberg and Harris, uh, or book or three two six four and all that or something like that. Book. Uh, I don't know if it's an article or a book. Uh, that also has um, uh, that I think is an expansion of the um, Kleiman Laxo uh, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Right, are there any other questions? If, if there are none, let us thank uh, Raghavan for his very interesting talk. Uh, we shall be 